I think I think you're going to be pretty pretty stoked to see some of the material, particularly that you'll see up on the screen. Uh, with us today, to my right, you have David Landau. Um, David is a regular member, not on the board, but David has been absolutely instrumental in us putting together this project. Uh, Tom Cox, a uh, two-time national president and the chairman of our fundraising effort. And to his left is Mr. Chris Ritter, uh, our director of library, the best director of any library in the country, in my opinion, does a phenomenal job and is leading us into the next century with a, just a wonderful library. And uh, I'm your head janitor in Hershey, and you all know <laughs> me as well. So uh, thank you guys for coming. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we can not only uh, give you a lot of information, we can entertain you, and you can go away with a greater appreciation of this amazing project that we have. Um, just a little background. This is something that's not completely new to AACA. Many, many years ago, we determined that we were running out of room at National Headquarters. Our building is approximately 80 years old, uh, not in the best shape, uh, not handicapped accessible. Uh, we needed more space for staff. Um, and in order to do a remodeling, we would have to meet all the new building codes. We were talking millions of dollars. And on top of that, we also found out that we had reached the limit of all of our variances with the township. So the problem with the library, that it was growing leaps and bounds, and uh, unless we were going to start sitting on books or putting them on a rooftop, we needed a new place to go. Uh, our first thought was to be with our museum in, in Hershey. And we're not going to go into that whole story. It didn't work. We tried everything in the world to, to find a way to make that all happen, and it didn't happen. So then our next step was, where can we go? Hershey, Pennsylvania, Dairy Township. Interesting fact, does everybody know where Hershey, Pennsylvania is? You, you need to tell me because there's no such thing as Hershey, Pennsylvania. It's Gary Township, which is kind of weird. I still haven't figured that one out. But um, there's very little property in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, almost impossible. Most of the property is owned by the Hershey Trust. And our friend back there. I can yell, too. Cut you off. So anyway, um, uh, there's very little property in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, huge problem for us. We started looking for land, and we virtually could not find any land anywhere in, in Derry Township. And actually started looking at a couple pieces of property in Harrisburg. Nope. Nope. No. No. Sure. Anyway. And, and that's the last thing. There's something that just didn't feel right about us moving to Harrisburg. Uh, We've been in Hershey forever. We're synonymous with Hershey. So um, we were scratching our heads, and, and we knew we were in for a huge issue because at that time we'd been promised a major collection coming out of the West Coast that would significantly add to our library, and we didn't have a place to put it. So um, So one day uh, I got an email from somebody, did you know that the PA American Water Company building's for sale? I said, no. And uh, I got on the phone to the realtor right away. Well, yeah, it's gonna be for sale, and, uh, but we're, it's not listed yet. And long story short, we got our, we got our name in front of them. Um, we uh, ended up in a little bit of a bidding war eventually on the, the, the property, but we knew intuitively that this was the, if we, if you had asked anybody in AACA, I think any board member, where would you like your national headquarters to be if it could be anywhere? We would all take in that pin and we would put it right in front of our show field for the fall nationals in Hershey. Couldn't be a better, better place that we could ever ask for. Well, the building came for sale. We ended up to be the successful bidder. Um, I want to say one thing about that, and I'm going to turn it over to the other people who can speak much more eloquently and more 
enthusiastically on, on some of the, the major portions of this deal. Derry Township is a very unique community. It's a very expensive community. Property is all time high. The AAC National Board made a huge leap of faith for the future of this club, for the future of the hobby, in going out aggressively in getting this property, to the point that it even made me nervous. But in the end, when the bank appraised the property, we were within pennies of what we paid for the property. So, and as most of you know, bank appraisals are, are pretty conservative. So we got ourselves a phenomenal piece of property in the best location ever. And when you see the material that David's gonna to present to you and hear from Chris and, and Tom, you're gonna to be, I think, pretty proud of the job that this organization has done for you because this, this is not our building, this is your building. And uh, we, hope, we hope at the end that every one of you goes out and says, man, these guys killed it. They really, really did a great job for AACA, for the, the future of the hobby, because remember, big part of this building is a free public library, America's Automotive Library, one of the few places in the country that you can go and get research for free. So with that, I'm gonna take, turn it over to David, and um, he's got a presentation for you. So, the site plan's a little on the crude side. We have a, a much better colored up site plan in the works. That's, that's coming, but for those of you that haven't seen the site or been out or, or read about it on the website, it's situated at the southwest corner of the intersection of Hershey Park Drive and North Hawkersville Road. It is, uh, Hershey Park Drive is one of the more heavily traveled streets in Hershey. Everybody hear me okay? Good, okay. One of the more heavily traveled streets. The site is obviously a corner location and located at a signalized intersection. It's accessed via North Hawkersville, which is a secondary road, which on a commercial site like this is very desirable as far as accessibility. What you don't want is your visitors and guests trying to access the site via a very busy road where it's difficult to get to the site. So the, the secondary road access adds a lot of value to the site and of course being at a signalized intersection is tremendous. Um, adding a lot of desirability to the site is its topography. For those of you that haven't seen it, the building is situated up on a bluff. So when you drive by it on uh, Hershey Park Drive, the building is situated, um, the building is situated elevated and it's, it's very visible. So as you'll see in the renderings, we're gonna show you the signage, which we're gonna locate at the top of the building is very, very visible from the street. Um, for those of you that have seen commercial buildings, you drive by them and they're down low, obviously that goes to desirability of the site. This one, the topography couldn't have been any better for what AHA wants to do. Um, it's also good for flood protection. The site is not in a 100-year floodplain. They have no drainage problems. Having the building sited the way it is, the engineers back in 1980 that set this up did a very good job. Um, despite the desirability of the site and its existing layout, it presented some challenges. Um, there is, there is a, this new driveway entrance that you see here, and Chris, I think you could probably at this point bring up one of the, um, one of the, you could bring up one of the perspectives. Or, <coughs> let's see, I think, I'll show you which one. No, give me, nope. That'll work, that's a good one. You can see, from this that the building now has driveway access. So you come in from Hawkersville, drive down the driveway, and then there is a circular drive here in front of the building, so you can drive up to the building's entrance now. The existing building was extremely problematic. When you drive up to the building, you park, you get out of your car, and in front of you is a loaded <coughs> back door. 
That was the access to the building. So we looked at it a lot of different ways, many, many different ways, on how to create a good experience for the visitors and guests and everyone else that's going to be coming to this building. There was a proposal to knock the corner of the building off here and create a spectacular two-story corner entrance. That was not in the budget. What was created is an entrance in the center of the building. It actually works out really well when you guys see the lobby layout and the way it functions with the lobby, which is now two stories. Um, so that's where we wound up with the entrance and the driveway to create the access that the building needs. Um, building structure. AACA did a great job because they, they, in terms of being lucky, they found a building that had what we call really, really good bones. When AACA signed its contract, it was the successful winner of a bidding contest um, to secure the property. They did a great job through that process. I, I wasn't involved in it, but at hearing from Steve what was going on, it was handled exceptionally well, and they won the day. So Steve contacted me to find out, well, what have we won? Well, during the due diligence period, a great deal of studies were done of the building to determine just what AACA had and what was it going to take to convert this building from an early 1980s design, all the problems with the site, all the problems with the interior of the building that just didn't work for AACA. They did environmental studies, they did structural engineering studies, architectural studies, studies of the condition of the facade, studies of the condition of the window systems, just an exhaustive amount before taking the plunge and going hard on this contract. They wanted to be certain as to what they were getting. Well, it turned out that they got a building with great bones, that it would lend itself to the restoration they were going to need. Um, structurally, very robust building in terms of its steel structure. Also in terms of the facade. The facade is in great shape. The studies came back showing all the masonry was good, the window systems were good, but structurally, as far as codes go, there was going to have to be some upgrading. Structurally, horizontally, the building was incapable of supporting the library. So there are structural modifications that had to be done to the second floor to horizontally hold the, hold the loads. Vertically, more structural modifications as a result of codes. Not that this building had any problems. It's still standing, so it obviously was built well. There weren't any problems. But under the new codes, vertically, the building needed to be additionally supported structurally to support lateral wind loads. That's being done. So that is the extent of the structure, other than on the second floor, the second floor was cut back by a total of 2,300 square feet to create a two-story lobby atrium. We'll talk more about what the atrium does for you guys in a few minutes. Um, HVAC system was determined to be a total mess. Would not work for the library, would not work for anything. An early 80s design, extremely inefficiency, extreme inefficiency. You guys wouldn't have been able to afford to run it. So it was determined that a complete total new HVAC system had to be put in the building. Life safety. There was none. There's no fire protection system in the building other than fire alarm pole stations and standpipes. That was it. The building needed to be adapted for a complete fire protection system. Uh, the building is protected hydraulically, meaning water sprinklers, except for the library, which will be protected with a gas system. The library was located on the second floor for that reason. It would have been great to have it on the first floor, slab on grade, no structural modifications, but there are larger factors in play. The biggest factor is you can't have a library with sprinklers going off, destroying priceless literature. So that's why the second floor had to be modified structurally, to move the library up there to where there would be no sprinklers above it. Um, the HVAC system was very carefully and, and, and well thought out. In fact, 
we're still changing things, and we're still thinking it out. But it's, it's a gas-fired, variable air volume heating system and air conditioning system. Many, many zones throughout the building. There's a conference room that'll have a separate zone. There is a um, classroom that'll have a second, separate zone. The library is on a separate zone. When I say separate zone, individual thermostats, all individually controllable. You might say, boy, that's going to add some expense. Actually not. A lot of savings in terms of operating a system that way. The gas-fired heating system that's going in there, while you can design a more efficient system, we took into account three things. Initial cost, ability to operate the system without a lot of difficulty, and efficiency of operation. Most important being efficiency of operation and can we operate this thing without an engineer? And what is it like to maintain? So the system going in is a balance of everything. It's, there is no system that's perfect. I think this one, as do the engineers, believe that it achieves everything that AACA is going to want to get from it. Obviously, tenant comfort's important, and we have put a tremendous amount of thought into the mechanical and HVAC system. Uh, electrical, di electrical distribution in the building was good. The electrical mains required no upgrading. Uh, obviously, the electrical systems are being torn all the way back to the electrical main panels. The new distribution comes out, but the electric distribution in the building was excellent, which saved a lot of money. So, the bottom line is from its studies, AACA was able to determine that this building was going to work ex exceptionally well. Um, Architecture was a challenge, an extreme challenge. Taking an early 80s building and renovating it so that AACA could present the right experience for the building's visitors, all tastefully done, without being overdone, it was a balance. It really was a balancing act. But again, with the structure as it was originally designed, they were able to modify the building in a way where it really befits what the club is doing, it befits the club's image, it's not overdone, yet it's not underdone. You're not going to drive up to it and say, this, this is their new building, and you're not going to drive up to it and say, wow, you know, these guys spent way too much money. We, we really went for a balance with the design to make the right statement for the club <coughs> and what it stands for. The existing building has a projection on the front of the building. That's being torn off now. Construction is underway. This new entrance, it's virtually a new building from this point to this point. So the entire front of the building is torn off from the top all the way to the ground from here to there. Um, let's see, went through the HVAC already. Lobby atrium. Another challenge is how do we create, when you walk into this building, a lobby that defines a visitor's experience. For those of you who have walked into this building and seen the existing lobby, we had a lot of work, as, as did the architects, a lot of work. Um, we knocked out 2,418 square feet of the second floor to create this two-story lobby. Chris is going to run a video and it walks you through. You'll see exactly how the lobby functions. It's a two-story atrium and in that atrium is a focal point staircase, which is a very popular thing to do in these two-story lobbies now. The staircase, of course, runs from the first floor to the second floor and it's, it's going to be beautiful. It's an architectural, designed to be an architectural focal point. Um, you get to the second floor, glass abounds. We took advantage as much as we could of this atrium that we're paying all this money to build. So you have conference room here that overlooks the atrium. What's on the other side? I don't remember. On that side. Offices and, and the, uh, the open area for you guys when you come in to do research, you're going to have a beautiful view looking outside as well. Right. The exactly. The public space that where you sit down and do your research in the library, you'll be able to get up, mosey around, and 
walk right over to the overlook there, overlooking the atrium. In the atrium, there's space for eight cars. Club can rotate exhibits through. You might have some of their permanent exhibits. Also in the atrium will go all of the club's national award trophies. Trophy cases are being designed custom, and the architects are also looking at how and where to place those cases most appropriately to blend in with the cars. For the future, that could be expanded if you want cases to display artifacts or rotating exhibits. You've got the space to do it. Um, what else have we got? The, originally, when AACA bought the building, each floor was 15,690 feet. Big floors. <clears throat> Obviously, the top floor has been reduced, by, reduced down to 13,000 square feet because of the lobby. Um, we talked about fire protection. I think really that covers what's been done in terms of what I can describe. I think the video will now enable you to connect the dots about everything that I've told you about. So we'll let Chris run that. <clears throat> So you drive in from, is it North Hawkersville, right? Hawkersville. Okay, so you drive in from Hawkersville, you come around, then you come up the driveway, and it shows you exactly how the site functions as far as the approach to it. I think the plan is, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but this can also be used for little event gatherings and, and whatnot outside, parking of antique cars and whatnot. a good view of the lobby and then it shows the atrium that was created and this is the staircase that I mentioned. There is there's the library space that I mentioned where you have a view out over the lobby and not only that, there's a lot of glass in the lobby so you have a view over those beautiful vistas as well. Okay. stopped it a little late. One of the things that you'll see on the floor plans, which Chris will flash up there for you, is that throughout the building there's extensive use of interior glass to preserve views for virtually everybody in the building. I mentioned the size of the floor is almost 16,000 feet. That makes this building a deep building in terms of its dimensions. And to make the space work as good as possible and get as much daylight in, there's extensive use of glass, which you'll see as you walk through the video walkthrough. You'll see how we brought as much daylight into the interior of the building as we could. about the building that I mentioned earlier is presently when you drive to the building, you park over here, and then there's a sidewalk that goes up to the building's existing entrance. No protection whatsoever for visitors. If it's raining, snowing, lousy weather, you gotta get out of your car over here, and you gotta go out in the weather and, and walk to the building's entrance. There's not even a canopy over the building's entrance right now. We did 
design a canopy, the cost to extend the canopy out far enough to cover an, an entire car, as well as the distance of a door of the car opening and the driver getting out was too much. Structurally, it would, it would, you'd have to add columns. It would be a big job to carry. So this canopy, the way it's designed as you drive in, is protection for whoever you're dropping off. We felt that that was the best compromise in terms of, of cost. But it, it does lend protection now for visitors of the building in bad weather. <clears throat> basically the nuts and bolts of the building. Chris can talk, talk about what we've done as far as the floor plans and why the interior is laid out the way it is. And um, I will speak again if you want me to about the real estate and the value. When you're ready. Yeah, I'm just... <clears throat> Do I need more? We got nothing. Yeah, just... I'm just going to reposition this here, folks, and we're going to take you through the second floor, which is obviously close to my heart, the library. Um, first thing I should say is that everybody that's a member of the club should be truly proud of what's being built here and truly proud of what the leadership team, the three guys sitting up here, the building committee, and your board of directors, what they're doing is setting up the hobby and setting up your club for uh, decades, if not generations. Uh, they're truly living this, breathing this nonstop. Myself and the library staff, we're lucky because we get to go home at night and uh, hang out with our kids and get full night's sleep. Then we come back and hear stories about how Steve got up at two in the morning and was thinking about the color for uh, wall plate switches. David's thinking about lateral loads. You know, Tom's on the road all the time. It's just to truly see what's going on behind the scenes you all don't get to see it, I do. Uh, just know that they're working as hard as they possibly can for you and they're doing a great job. Um, so now we got the library. When I started here 12 years ago, uh, I interviewed and Steve said, oh yeah, we're gonna get a new library. And I figured, you're right, right, that's gonna, that's gonna happen. Sure it's gonna happen, Steve. And uh, I sat down and wrote some ideas about what a new library would look like and what we absolutely had to have tuck those away in a drawer, and lo and behold, here we are just a few months from actually moving into it. So it's a, it's a real dream come true for not just me, but for a lot of other people. And uh, again, you all should be proud because this is your library and we're protecting your material. The, uh, fortunately, when we went into this, we knew about the Philadelphia Library acquisition. We knew, Steve had mentioned, we knew about a couple donations that we haven't received yet that are coming from the West Coast. So we built in some, some room to grow, so to speak. And when you see the, the very top of the screen there is our, our mobile high density stacks. And uh, we've more than doubled the footprint of that area. So even with the acquisition of the Philadelphia Library and some other collections, large collections that we're gonna get, we're still only gonna be at about 60% capacity. Room to grow and room to expand. Right now we house, as many of you know, we house uh, 10 special collections within our library. Different market clubs retain ownership of their material, but use our services. They're able to expand and grow as well. It's a great, a great relationship. The, aside from expanding our high density area, we're going to significantly expand the area where the public can actually come in and hang out and do their research. That area is going to triple, if not quadruple, each desk area is going to have very sufficient lighting, electrical hookups. It's going to be a state-of-the-art research center, uh, an area where you're absolutely going to want to spend hours, if not a couple days, coming back. I should also mention that in the high-density area, it's going to be very, very well climate-controlled. It's going to be climate-controlled properly. <laughs> so we're going to keep the temperature 68 degrees year-round and the humidity is not going to fluctuate outside of 40 to 60 percent. What that means for you, absolutely perfect storage conditions for paper. So our rare, one-of-a-kind, irreplaceable items are protected for the long haul. You see on the left-hand side of the screen there we have our classroom, and I'm super excited about that because that's going to let the library come alive in a lot of different ways. 
We're going to be able to host public programs, so we can introduce the club, the auto hobby, to people who aren't necessarily AACA members. But then if your region or chapter wants to have a tour up to the uh, library and headquarters building, they can come out. If there's a specific mark club that wanted to have a tour or a, or a meeting in the area, they're going to be able to use that classroom to show movies, do a uh, 3D printing workshop, study the history of Whitworth threads, you know, you name it, we'll be able to do it in that classroom. And it, and it really, again, is going to make the library come alive. It's not just a warehouse for old books and old paper. On the right-hand side of the, the floor there, you're going to see a couple of private meeting rooms. Again, very flexible with what we can do with those. Future expansions for special collections. It's going to be an area where small groups can meet. Uh, it just makes the whole space very, very flexible. Uh, you probably can't read it because I can barely read it from where I'm standing, but over here, this area is very important because that's going to be a permanent media studio and digitization room. As you know, you're all spread out across the country, and digitization as we go forward is absolutely critical, not just to preserve the material, but to get the information to you very quickly. So we'll have all of our equipment up, set up permanently, and they have the volume of material that we'll be able to scan, preserve, and get out to you, uh, the end user, is going to increase significantly. Media Studio, that sets us up to do videos, podcasts, uh, video blogs. Uh, really, the sky's the limit for that. So, in a uh, three-minute nutshell, that's the library. Uh, I can tell you the staff is absolutely thrilled about welcoming you to that building. And... Uh, we're going to be overwhelmed, and we nervously await that day when we can be overwhelmed. So remember, it's your, your library. Be proud of it and use it, because it's yours. <laughs> OK, now we're looking at the first floor. And it's not the library, so I don't really care about it. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> about to take the mic away from you. <laughs> uh, David alluded to some of the reasons that the library had to be on the second floor. Um, you know, you got the, the sprinkler system that we couldn't have. Uh, but just the way that we, the club does business, the way that we receive shipments from trucks, the way that we ship out our trophies and merchandise, it just it wasn't logistically sensible to have it on the second floor. So you can see on the right-hand side, the top right corner, that's our loading dock. And that's set up perfectly for our mail room. And for our trophy room, no longer do we have to bend over to put little or heavy boxes into a little tiny dumb waiter that we've been using for decades. Uh, everything's going to flow very seamlessly and smoothly in that right-hand corner. Uh, if you have merchandise as well, we'll be able to ship that right out there in the top right-hand corner of the room. As David mentioned, as you walk in, this is the, the crown jewel of the building will be the display area display area for at least eight cars. Depending on what they are, we may be able to fit some more. Depending on what they are, we may be able to not fit any more, uh, as, as you'll learn down the road. Uh, display cases and information about the club and the hobby will be spread out throughout the main level there in the atrium. And then the main staff area is going to be in the back left corner of the, the building. This area right here is going to remain empty for a while. Uh, it's going to be used to process merchandise and uh, various paperwork that we need to do with the possible future, future expansion of some workspace areas. We will have a gift shop permanently in the first floor. And as you come into the building, you'll be greeted by our receptionist and greeter and give you the opportunity to redo your membership by an AACA shirt, hat, or whatever you may need. And uh, then you can go on to the library via the elevator or by the stairs. This area, because of the height of the ceiling, is going to be separated by doors, uh, and that'll keep our HVAC costs at a reasonable level. The, uh, you guys probably don't really care, but the staff will enter in the back of the building in that uh, staircase up on the top. And Steve, do you have anything to add about the first floor? Uh, just, you know, I think a lot of you, you know, you've built houses and you always know that when you get finished, you wish you did this and you wish you did that. I, I can tell you that one of the big goals from the very, very beginning 
was to let the people that are going to work in that building have some input. So all of the staff were able to see the plans, were able to say, is this going to work for you? Should your office be here? How should the flow go so that we can make this the most efficient building possible for the people that actually have to work in there as well as the guests? And I think we pretty well nailed that that portion of it. Of course, once we get in, who the heck knows what's going to happen. But, but right now, it looks really, really terrific. And, and this was a real team effort with the architects, with David and, and all of his expertise and his company and, and the board of directors and Chris and everybody else. Um, I think when you see the finished product uh, all, and see all this come alive, you're going to be even more impressed with the, with the end product. And, I know there's a, I, I love, I'm looking out here at Sally Barnett, and Sally Barnett's a librarian, and her dream was to see a new library, and uh, she's been a major contributor to this project, and I know she's just got to be sitting here just proud as can be and as excited as can be, and as I'll hope, hopefully all of you will, but it's um, been a great, great project to be involved with. Um, Excuse me? Yeah, we're going to let David talk to you a little bit more about, um, we do still have time for some, for Tom and for some questions and answers, but David's going to talk to you a little bit about the value of this building and, and what we got for our money. Steve already talked about a little bit property values, especially commercial property values in Hershey. That was just one of many challenges facing the club to pull a deal like this off. Um, but when Steve first approached me about what the club had done is, is, is getting this property under contract, um, he really, I, I would say, set the strategy for how this was going to be done. Um, and he was the one who put together the development team and did a, a hell of a job doing it. The, the strategy was, number one, there's only so much money, there's only so much money that's going to be available to do this. But more importantly, when the building is done, despite facing the high ground costs, high acquisition costs for the building, and the expense of renovating it, he did not want the club to go upside down with this thing. He didn't want the building to finish out at a value <clears throat> way under what the club was going to pay. He wanted it to be a real estate deal that any third party would do. He didn't want to be upside down with it. He didn't want to finish with a building where the club had spent millions more than it was worth. Well, <clears throat> it looks like based on the construction contract that's signed and all the costs that have come in to date that the building is going to be worth in excess, substantially in excess, of what you guys have paid to do the deal. And as time goes on, it's worth more. Property values keep going up in Hershey and the building becomes worth more and more. Um, the other goal that Steve set, and he was insistent, and that the development team follow the rules. And the rule is no debt. The building has to be completed, and if there is debt to fund the project during the construction period, that debt has to be retired shortly after completion or before completion. <clears throat> That's a tall order. It was a tall order. He put together a development team. He selected the architects, who have been absolutely wonderful, Greenfield architects, have been great to work with. He selected the general contractor, which is Calvin High's company, High Construction. Fabulous to work with. Been incredibly cooperative. We had to get a new engineering survey. He selected the engineering company to do that. Found the environmental guys to do that. He entered into the, he entered into the contract with the construction management firm. So, <clears throat> Like any real estate project, any commercial project, someone's got to have the vision. Someone's got to set the rules. And we are where we are with a great project like this, with the cost coming in at or under budget, a building that will finish out 
in terms of a real estate investment for the club that will look good on its balance sheet without going upside down as a result of an original vision and sticking to it. And uh, as hard as us consultants tried to veer from the vision, somebody kept pulling us back. And Steve did a, a great, great job of that. Uh, the word of the day for this is diligence. Um, even after Greenfield finished their drawings, <clears throat> we went to various engineering firms, architecture firms, people within my own firm, to do peer reviews of the drawings to check them. We didn't want anything left to chance on this. This is a tight budget. We have to make the budget. So the drawings went through what we call a peer review to make sure nothing was missed. Or can we value engineer something? Did the architect specify something that we can do for less money the same way and achieve the same goal? So that's all been done. And the drawings have been substantially revised as a result of those peer reviews. So in terms of creating value, I, I, I don't think much more diligence could have been done. And Steve was absolutely insistent that not a dollar get wasted. As with any project of this magnitude, with so many consultants working on it, all of us passionate about what we do, there were times where we were at odds. But in the end, I think you can see from the renderings what the end product is. And uh, I think it's going to serve the club very well. Everyone who's worked on it has been highly committed to it. You have a development team that kept on task. We didn't have a choice. <laughs> Working with Steve. We stuck to the original vision and parameters. But we created a lot of value. Uh, this is going to be a project to carry this club forward for decades to come. All at the right numbers. And uh, I think the members should be, should be very proud of all of the effort of, of everybody uh, that, that worked on the project, all of the consultants. And I think now we're probably ready for questions. I'm sure there's a lot of them. We'll let Tom talk a little okay. bit about the, the fundraising. But I just, I just want to say, all that money I paid David to say good things about me, it, man, he came through big time. Trust me, guys. This, this, this was a gigantic team effort um, between Tom, the staff, the board of directors, and you know, I'm being extremely honest here. This project would never have come to fruition the way it has now without this gentleman to my right. Pure and simple. It would be an entire seminar, truly, for me to tell you the level of detail and dedication that he has given to this club, the time, the money, the effort in straightening my butt out, because I made a whole bunch of mistakes during this project, um, just as invaluable to the club. Maybe one of the single biggest contributions to, to AEC and the history of this club. So, um, just... Very grateful for everyone, and now we're going to turn it over to the money man, Mr. Cox, who's going to tell you we need to get even more money from all you guys. I get the tough job at the end. They get all the fluff, and I got to get your money. That's what it all boils down to. I just want to tell you a couple of quick things, just a few short comments. One is, this whole project, and this whole organization, and our collective visions for the future is driven by one thing, and that's passion. A really, really strong passion. A passion for the automobile, a passion for our automotive community, a passion for our friendships, and a passion to share it with everyone else in the entire world. And that's exactly what we're postured to do. With the completion of this building, this is going to be what I would call, what I like to call, the launch pad for the future of AACA and the future of this hobby. That is our launch pad right there because it's going to be a genesis for us and a genesis for the hobby. And we 
are so singularly grateful and fortunate to have the staff that we have within AACA. These people are second to none. Running my own operation, I can tell you again that our staff, no disrespect to my own staff, I have great staff, these guys are fantastic. And I'm always privileged to be able to work with each and every one of them because they are all first rate. And those are the people that are going to be operating your building, running your club once we get right there as you see it. The other thing I want to say is, in terms of the passion and the team and everyone there, um, you know, these guys are right. But these two guys here worked tirelessly. Yeah, I worked a little bit. These guys worked tirelessly. And the, the passion involved in, in getting it right, I mean, we've all practically killed one another over this whole thing. But it's only because we care about what's going on and we see how much you guys care about what's going on and what we can, can do for the future. The other thing I'd like to say is, in terms of our project, the last thing you want to do is go ask somebody to give, to give money to something that you wouldn't give to yourself. In other words, if we didn't feel very strongly about the membership as a collective, and being good stewards of your money, time, donations, and everything else, we wouldn't feel very good about asking you for money or asking you about the future of AACA because that's what you're doing. You're paying it, I don't know, not only present, but you're paying it forward for that next generation to keep AACA operating for decades into the future and being the cornerstone of our hobby. That's what AACA is. It's the cornerstone of this entire hobby. And it will be worldwide. We've been extremely, well, I'll back up. So, if you think about it going all the way back to those very first phone calls about, hey, there's a building for sale, and you know, you'll never guess. It's like right on our show field and so forth, and no idea how much it was going to cost or how much time it was going to take or you know, all of the effort that would go into getting to where we're close to being at. It was uh, one of those situations where everybody, the board of directors, the staff, everyone, knew we had to try to do this. Because if we didn't do it, we might as well have just hunkered down, pulled into our shell, and waited for what comes. And we're not going to do that. We're going to set the pace for the next 50 years in the hobby with this building. It was daunting because it costs money to do this and a lot of resources to do this. Decision was made, kind of scary. I'll just flat out tell you. It's, it, you know, it was one of those things we, we could have failed, could have failed, easily could have failed. We haven't. We haven't failed. I'm here today to tell you that with this project, we've had such a tremendous amount of success, an incredible amount of success. I've been a part of other capital campaigns involving several millions of dollars. I can tell you that this is the single most successful campaign, and it's not because of me, it's because of our team, but more than anything, it's because of you guys that this is successful. The amount, the outpouring of philanthropy from our hobby is astonishing. It's astounding. In only really nine months, we've raised 80 plus percent, really, of what is needed to complete this project debt-free. Go back to what David said earlier, El Mosco here is like, no debt. 
not going to, we're no debt. And we're going to, we're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. I will tell you, um, we still need your help. Once we get into this building, we're going to have to set about the tasks of making AACA available everywhere. And that's promoting it within the hobby, not only in the U.S., elsewhere, all over. So we've got a lot of, lot of work to do, and it's all going to be done here. We're, I'm going to tell you at this point, still in need of two million dollars as our goal. So we still need to raise that money and you think about that and that's a lot of money, there's no doubt about it, two million dollars is a lot of money. But when you think about the fact that we have had philanthropy of substance, seven figures come from our membership members of our membership to support this project and we have had hundreds and hundreds of fifty dollar donations and five hundred dollar donations and thousand dollar donations and cars and, and donations of stock and everything else we're going to make this and we're going to get it done we really put a push on we in the last 90 days to give you some perspective so that you feel good about it we've been able to raise 1.5 million dollars in, in just the last 90 days. We see the finish line, it's close. It really is, I'm serious. The finish line is close. I can't express to you how important it is for us to reach the finish line and to pay for this. And it'd be a phenomenal thing, and you think about it, it shows the strength of this organization and its membership and its club and the club to see this project, a project of this size, not only completed, but paid for in a year's time. And that's testament to all of you and your love and care for the hobby. So, I'll end up by saying, this weekend particularly, we have an extraordinary opportunity that came to us. An anonymous donor approached us yesterday afternoon and told us that they would match every donation or pledge made during our annual convention this weekend here in Philly up to $250,000. We have the potential, the very real potential, of raising a half a billion dollars just this weekend in two days. If you can think about what you might be able to do, please let us know. We will figure out a way. Credit card, cars, check, whatever. Cash, credit cards, pledge. We'll do whatever is necessary to help you help us collectively, all of us. And uh, you can see Steve or I, um, or any of the library staff, and those folks will point you in all the right directions. And I'm going to uh, open it up and let Steve do some Q&A. Uh, yeah, just before that, I, I got called out of the, the seminar for, for an interesting call. Um, Tom just told you about the project this weekend. Uh, my, somebody put a, stat, a sign up. Uh, in the lobby about this opportunity this weekend to have your donations doubled. My staff has been overrun with money and they said, what do we do with all this money? It's coming everywhere. We're, we're taking credit card donations, we're taking checks, we're taking cash, uh, and this has happened just this afternoon. So this is a bit of good news that, and, and yes, we do take credit cards. You can see, you say, Tom, Tom or I, we're not taking credit cards, but you can see the staff up in the trade show and we do credit card machines. We'll have it tonight at our, our 
banquet. Uh, we'll have it all over this weekend. If there's any way that we can turn you upside down and get any money out of you, we absolutely will. If you leave here with one penny in your pockets, we have not done our job. Um, seriously, thank, thanks everyone. And you know, I, I want to say one thing. Whether you donate $10 or $50 or $1 million dollars or whatever, the fact that you care enough to help us, that's what's important. And every every dollar is important to this project. One, and, one let me interrupt one thing because I'm. Well, he wanted to interrupt first. Oh, good. <laughs> I, 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 but I'm more feeble-minded than David is. I'm very feeble-minded. We all like to talk. Yeah. I just want to tell you guys one thing, and I neglected to do that earlier, and that is, is of course, you know, we want every nickel you've got. Okay. All right. We'll just tell you while you're here this weekend. But if you know someone who is not here with us this weekend, who would be willing to make a substantial pledge to this organization, and you can contact them and get them to contact us, we'll take that too. It's a great opportunity for all of us here to reach out to people that we know that would be willing to, and this is the type of thing that goes is right up their alley. So it even extends beyond those of us that are here within this building. If you know of somebody that you feel like you can talk to tonight or tomorrow, and they'd be willing to make a pledge to our uh, operation or uh, give a credit card to us, we'll take it. Steve will take questions in, in a second. I, I, I don't want anybody to leave the room without understanding one thing. <clears throat> we can stand up here and we can talk about the nuts and bolts and sticks and bricks all day long. We're knocking walls down and moving walls and doing everything we got to do to get the building ready for the club's occupancy. But without the flow of money, none of it happens. And Tom, as the chairman of our finance committee, has gotten us to where we are today, as well as Steve's extraordinary fundraising abilities. He's dealt with a lot of high net worth individuals that have contributed large amounts of money, a lot at stake on every phone call with those guys, and done a phenomenal job with them. Tom has led the finance committee. And as I say, nothing happens without the flow of money. So in terms of your development team, Tom's leadership is what's kept this thing going. And I didn't want anybody to leave the room without giving a lot of credit to these two guys where credit is due. They are fundraisers extraordinaire. It's, it's, it's not my thing to do it, but it's been a pleasure to watch the way that these guys have handled it and the dedication that they've had towards it. Steve's the guy. He's a, he's a car dealer. What do you expect, huh? All right, enough from us. There's a whole lot. As you can tell, there's a whole lot of passion up on, on, this, on this front day as here. Any questions out there? Yes, uh, design life, uh, percent completion. How solid is the commitment with Hershey for the show fields and so on? And those are the three I have. Um, I'll, I'll answer the last one real quickly. Uh, the show field, I feel, is very, very solid. I've met with the CEO at, at Hershey Entertainment. Uh, that's a business and they could always change their mind. But his comment to me is that he said, Steve, you and I will be long gone before anything's done with that property. So I think we are in good shape for a while. And I gotta tell you, our relationship with Hershey Entertainment, if in fact that show field would change, we would have another show field that big or bigger somewhere else. There's a lot more property that you don't realize is there because that was a part of the old golf course, park, park the old golf course that we will add on to the... Okay, well, that answers the what if, yeah. yeah. Um, the other questions... Design were, life of the building and percent completion of construction. It, percent of completion of construction. The, the, the interior demo has been completely done. Now they're doing the exterior this week. Monday, the front of the building comes off, and then over the next six months, hopefully, we will have it all done. And design life, David's probably more more attuned to answer a good question on that. It's a great question. Des design life. You have a building that was built in the early 80s. We often 
we real estate developers often refer to buildings like this as 100-year structures. I would say, obviously, with the budget that the water company must have had to build a robust building like this, they certainly had in mind a 100-year structure. I would call this, with the building's renovation, everything being brought up to all of the newest codes, brand new roof on the building, and everything else being done to it, all the renovations, I would say we've reset the clock on a 100-year structure. That's how I would classify it. Certainly 100 plus. Obviously, that's going to depend on a lot of the maintenance that's done on it. But we've been careful to design as maintenance-free a building as we can in the selection of materials, in the selection of the engineering or the design of the lot of, a lot of the engineering. Operating cost has been taken into account and what is it going to take to maintain this building? Are we putting in as much maintenance-free materials, finishes, design as we can? What about taxes? Not yours. Taxes? We ain't got no stinking taxes. We don't, we, we, we've gone through the township. We have been approved for tax abatement. There is no real estate tax on this property. So we're, we're all, we're aces on that one. Sal? I haven't heard anything about any naming rights, like the Ford Research Room or the Hemmings, whatever you want. You have an idea? We have a ton of, we've, in our, all of our original materials and the original brochures and everything we've tried to put out, there's a ton of naming rights. It started out with a, a $2 million naming rights for the entire building, which was given to us by Calvin High. Um, there's still naming rights available. Um, you can see me, I can go through them afterwards. Uh, we, there's a lot of areas here that still have, have not been, been named. They, they are significant dollars for the most part, but this is an expensive building and your name will be there for posterity. Um, but we've, we've got them as low as $500. Uh, we still have a little of those left. We have a lot of the $1,000 ones left in the high density files. Um, but certainly, Sal, if you would like to give us a million or two, we'd be, we'd be happy to, to, uh, to rename the whole place. Five million, we'll, we'll redo the whole damn thing, okay? <laughs> Back there. There's nobody else involved in this project. This is a, the Antique Automobile Club of America's national headquarters. The only involvement is in our library, where, as Chris mentioned, we host other clubs' uh, uh, literature collections, which we're proud to do and, and happy to do for them because we're, we're all about helping the hobby. But this is our building solely owned by the members of AACA. Uh, Herb Oaks and, and there's a room that we talked about naming opportunities. Chris, can you throw that? Um, yes, that, that was fully funded and um, the decision was made on the first floor. If you want to know, there's, uh, excuse me, I, I have a little medical issue and I can't really reach up here. But the top two offices up there, over here, in the corner here. That's going to be in memory of our two great presidents, Herb Oaks and, and Dave Zimmerman, and the members and the regions fully funded those rooms. So, what sort of revenue do you anticipate getting out of the old building? The old building uh, has been sold already, um, sold immediately, uh, and it's sold for above the appraisal. I'm proud to say, considerably above the appraisal, and we sold it for 1.4 million. And it's most likely went to a doctor's group. No, it didn't. It, 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 was, it was scheduled to go there, but it actually went to a great group of local people, Brownstone Realty, and uh, they're going to have it as their company headquarters, and they'll have some real estate property. They're going to do a nice job with the, with the property. Yeah, because it would, yeah, it would have made plenty of sense for medical groups and so close. It would have, but... Um, first one with the money, that's, that's, that's who got it. Any other questions? Way in the back there. Yeah, Steve, 
with a 501c3 status in the library, were you able to get any grants to help pay for any of that? Grant, grants have been a very difficult, very difficult issue. We have not gotten a, we've gotten some personal grants, but we have not gotten any federal grants or other grants. Uh, that money is dried up big time so far. There may still be money out there. We're still trying. Um, I think all the museums and all the libraries now are, are fighting um, the difficulties of, of getting grants, particularly for capital improvements. Uh, they're mostly interested in projects that will benefit the community in other ways from minority programs, education, and things like that. But getting capital grants, that's a, that's a, a pretty difficult process. But in this fundraising effort, there's been some amazing, amazing people who have stepped up both anonymously in fact, most of them are anonymous right now, but the, we're going to mention one tonight that's going to kind of kind of shock you. But there's some people that have recognized what we're trying to do here and recognize the value that this club has for the future of the hobby and have stepped up amazingly. And uh, that's pretty heartwarming. Yes? What's going to happen with these stuff at the current library that people have donated, like there's a building plaque out front by the library door? Um, what's going to happen with that? Because with that item that people have donated that are in the old library now. Well, a lot of the stuff will go with us. It, we have a history room in the downstairs floor. We'll have, we're going to keep some of the stuff. We've, we've asked, we've had one family that had a plaque that was important to them. They asked for it back. We're sending it back, absolutely. Um, we've got a brand new modern building. We can't fill it up with artifacts that are going to change the whole look, feel of, of this thing. But we'll attempt to keep everything we can. We'll attempt to keep our history and we'll figure out uh, we're, we're not going to be throwing things away that are important, but there's a lot of little plaques. There's a plaque down there in one of the restrooms. Uh, I'm sorry, we're not keeping that plaque. I mean, there's just, I mean, th these plaques were donated for that building. This is our new building. This is all brand new, and, and those people that support that, that's where their names are gonna be. Greatly appreciative of all the stuff people did for our former building, but we're on to another century now, and those are the people that, that uh, you're gonna see with plaques in the new building. Future expansion. I'm going to wait. There's going to be somebody coming after me that's going to handle that question. <laughs> There's room. We have six acres there. Um, there's possibility, but man, I hope I'm not involved in that project. David has convinced me that my days as a real estate person are are long, long gone, and that uh, I should find a new line of work. So uh, I'm. Uh, uh, who knows, but that would be a great thing if we needed it. That would be a great thing. You know, we've got a six-car garage off to the side. Who knows what could be done with that somewhere down the road. Uh, right now, that uh, something that Sally and her family have uh, uh, named, but uh, we can make that even a, a fancier show place down the road. So um, that's the great thing. We have six acres. When we were first looking into this project and building elsewhere, we were talking about getting three acres. Now we have six acres in the most beautiful corner that you could ever imagine, and, and it, it, allows, it allows people like these uh, real estate developers first to say, hey, you know, you can do this and you can do that. And uh, I keep saying, no, I'm, I, I don't want no part of that right now. Anything else, folks? We haven't published it. We don't have the final figures, but it's going to be north of 10 million total. That's the number I was thinking because he's looking for two, and you have 80 percent of your number, so I figured it was 10. Yeah, it's going to be north of. It's an expensive project, guys. There's no question about it. And sometimes people shock. How can you spend that kind of money? But in the end, it was how could we not? Because this is for a whole other generation. This is for many, many years to come. A lot of us are not going to 
heck, I'm not going to have that much. I'm so old at this point, I'm not going to have that much benefit from it. But this is going to be, this, this is going to allow some things that we don't even realize we can do for the benefit of the hobby and to help save this hobby. I mean, that, that's really, in a sense, what this is all about. It's, it's We're trying to make sure that not only AACA prospers in the future, but that the antique car hobby is strong and vibrant, vibrant and that we save history. Because that's what all of us, all of us here in this room here are historians, and that's what we want to save. We never want to see that. We never want to see that die. It means too much to this, to this country, and the automobile means too much to this country. And I'm not running for president, but, you know, that, that's my stump speech. What you're really saying is, by next fall, you will have raised $10 million. Congratulations. We will. Thank you. Thank you. And that extra million you're going to give us this afternoon will really come in handy. Give the man a round of applause, folks. We just have another million. What did you need names for yourself? How about the men's room? Steve, Steve. Just one comment and observation. Uh, my home library burned on election day a year, a year and a half ago. The reconstruction of that library, 9,000 square feet, it's going to take three and a half million dollars. This is 28,000 square feet, and you're talking 10 million. This is right in the ballpark for the cost of a library construction. This is not anywhere out of line. Let me tell you a quick little story. I don't want to keep everybody from the passion that this building had. We had a little something happen in this building. I'll make the story short. There was a car that sold at the fall meet at the RM auction, sold for a half a million dollars to an AACA member. Another AACA member said, Man, would that look good in the lobby of the AACA headquarters? He got together with the other guy, he bought the car, and that car is going to go in our new atrium. That's the passion. With that, if there's no more questions, we'll be up here. If you've got any more things that you're afraid to ask, uh, come on up. We'll be happy to talk to you. Thanks for showing up, guys, and, and uh, look forward to hosting you in our new building. And, and don't forget, this weekend, through the end of your time here, we've got that opportunity. I want to make sure that we match that 250 and end up walking out of here with 500, a half a million dollars. So do what you can to help us out. We really appreciate it. It's for all, for everybody.